Hi, I'm Tom Travatt, and this is Photography Adjacent, a podcast about photography and everything else. Each week on our show, we speak to artists, activists, writers, and the occasional photographer to learn about life through their lens. Hello, and welcome back to the Photography Adjacent podcast. Today, I have the great pleasure of interviewing Johnny Edward, who some of you may know online as Johnny Creative. That's certainly his Instagram handle. Uh, today, we talk about his journey into photography from leaving a corporate job, um, exploring his creativity, and even some kind of ups and downs along the way. We talk about his use of natural light, and studio light, and especially in the way that he constructs his studio as a kind of welcoming place for people to come and feel themselves, um, be able to explore some facets of themselves that he can bring out of them in his work. Uh, it's a really lovely conversation. Halfway through, I get a knock on the door, so there might be a little interruption there where there's a jump cut. Um, so just be aware that that's what's happened. Um, yeah, so I hope you can uh, join into the conversation. Remember to like and subscribe to this video, to the channel, or uh, if you follow us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, um, just hit the follow button there. Um, everything helps us grow and get more people, get some eyes and ears on what we're doing here. Thank you very much. Johnny Edward, uh, welcome to uh, Photography Adjacent, the podcast. Um, I know you online as Johnny Creative, as lots of people will do. Um, it's really great to have you here. I think I've been following you on Instagram for probably around about a year, year and a half now. Um, seeing your incredible work, beautiful work. I think a lot of people are uh, big fans of your work, especially in the photography community. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, before we begin, can you tell us a little bit about your yourself, your background, where you're from? You're currently in Denver, Colorado. Tell us more. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm based here in Denver. That's where my studio is at. My background is, I don't know, that might take up the whole episode to go into my background. <laughs> um, I would, I would like to describe myself as a renaissance man that might be a little bit egoic but i've lived many lives so i actually went to college for biochemistry and electrical engineering mm. uh with the plan of going into biomedical engineering or medicine um since no one's calling me dr john obviously that didn't happen much to the chagrin of my mother who never lets me forget about that <laughs> um but i worked uh, I, I owned a gym for athletes coming out of college i was an emt for many years i worked in the digital marketing sector um, I've done a host of things. I've owned tree businesses and masonry businesses. So sort of the life of the creative adhd -er until they mm -hmm. sort of found their, found their place. So it was probably um, almost a decade ago now. Wow, time is cruel. But <laughs> it was probably a decade ago or so. Uh, I was working a corporate job, and by all societal standards, I was doing very well for myself. So I was making good money and I had the things and, and all of that, but I was miserable inside. And I think most people can relate to that feeling of, of doing something and giving away their life for a paycheck, which is a brutal way to exist. Um, and I was so miserable and a, a dear friend of mine said, hey, you know, when you were younger, photography was really important to you. Maybe you should pick up a camera again. So uh, I was a film shooter when I was younger, of course, and I shot Pentax. So I found like Me a Pentax too. K3, a little crop sensor <laughs> camera, yeah. and essentially the Nifty 50 by Pentax. And I picked that up and I, it was, I was in a bad way. Um, I, I probably can't exaggerate that enough. But suffice it to say, I got behind the camera and the camera was almost like a barrier for me. So it allowed me to go back into the world sans anxiety and all of the fear and apprehension and tension I was feeling and start to create. And there was this really pivotal moment where um, at that point in time, I was still living in Denver, but across from this beautiful park called City Park that had a lake. And so I walked across the street and I was dealing with just this high grade anxiety all of the time. And there was this stunning crimson red sunset. And I sat there and I took this photo across the lake. And so it was reflected. And I just looked at the back of my camera and I burst out in laughter and tears simultaneously. And it felt like I had forgot about myself for so long. Mm -hmm. And it was this really beautiful reconnection to a deeply seated part of myself. And that began mm -hmm. my love affair, or I guess, a reconnection to photography. And it was landscapes and flowers and, you know, urbex stuff and then street portraiture. And then people are like, hey, I love your work. Will you photograph me? Let me give you money. And I was mm -hmm. like, that sounds horrifying. No. <laughs> um, and they kept pushing the issue. And so I started doing that and fashion, I, maybe not even fashion, but style has always been a big part of my life. And so then yeah. people were like, hey, I have a boutique or I have a line coming out. Would you like to photograph it? And so as far as the professional side, it just 
sort of evolved very organically. I never expected to be doing this for a career, getting paid for it, but it was something that I loved so much. And then my professional world and my personal world and these passions sort of merged. And it's just been a blur in the best possible ways ever since. So that's that's sort of the the cliff's notes of my coming home to photography, if you will. That's fantastic. I, I, I also have a kind of coming home to photography story, which is somewhat similar, but I never had that kind of corporate job, which was sucking my soul. So my my experience was very much more kind of in academia, uh, okay. but, but in, in the art world as well. Um, but I, you know, I know this kind of, maybe get to a kind of like mid thirties, late thirties point yep. um, and, and re-examining your life thing. Um, Absolutely. For me, it was it's... in the middle of COVID. For a lot of people, it's like, oh, I've been working my ass off doing something which I mm, maybe don't enjoy that much. And photography often seems to be this thing that they pick up. It's true. They've, they've, it's like this thing they've, they've kind of had in their, in their mind they really love doing. And it's like, oh, actually, I, you know, now I want to do this. And people go into wedding photography, portrait photography. You started in all sorts of places, but you settled really on, on, on let's say portraiture, but it could I, be a kind of expanded version of portraiture. I think, I think it's sort of hard to categorize. When I, when I first started, I would say developing a sense of style for myself. Mm. Um, I sort of got pigeonholed into this idea of fashion photography because I was photographing fashionable folks, or at least in fashion forward ways. So my work has always been informed by fashion photography. Um, I always say this whenever I do one of these, I loathe the fashion industry. Sure. So, you know, fast fashion, the environmental waste, the labor elements, the, the, you know, objectification, all of these things. So I've tried to distance myself from that fashion photographer element. My work has shifted a lot since then, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't know. I, I, I like to think of myself almost as an editorial portrait photographer because in my mind editorial has to do with narrative mm -hmm. and i feel like what i'm always trying to do is to tell someone's story or to tell a version of a story through my interactions with individuals um, but it's an ever-evolving thing i think one of the big sort of um what do i want to say here a big shift for me internally was when i stopped referring to myself as a photographer and started referring to myself as an artist mm -hmm. for whom photography is my main medium of expression um, I feel like we do so much encapsulating as creatives and the more barriers and boxes we put around ourselves, the more we containerize ourselves, the less creative we can be because we operate within those bounds that we create for ourselves. Um, and that's a whole other rant and thing entirely. <laughs> no, it's great. I, 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 I like this um, understanding of yourself because in a way, like we are all working within a kind of commercial setting you know, as photographers. And, you know, you have to make a, a living, you have to run a business and you have to think about it in those terms. But I was talking to Barry before we started the interview about your work and we were very much saying, you're an artist first. This is primarily what you do and you show the work that you want to show, you create the work that you want to create. And in a way, you're not actually bowing to a certain pressure that may be coming from the outside. That's at least how it appears on Instagram. <laughs> I, I, I would say in the here and now, that's probably quite accurate. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's taken a, lo a long ways to get here. There's just the normal societal elements. There's the normal psychological elements. There's, of course, you know, the manipulative sort of pressure being exerted by social media consistently. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, so many people knock social media. I just had went on a little rant recently on a reel or live or whatever I was doing. And I said, I'm, I'm so indebted to social media. There's definitely mm -hmm. a vile aspect about it but i owe so much of my success and the connection to individuals such as you and all these people i know in this industry to that um but it's it's once again i think even there was this coming home to photography and then there was a coming home within photography to myself mm -hmm. and so much of that is shedding what i thought i ought to be or ought to do or ought to create or what was going to be marketable or what people were going to respond to and I think for me in the current marketplace, at least people are craving authenticity in all forms. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, COVID brought out a lot of really bad and a lot of really good, but we've sort of gotten to the stage where at least the people I interact with on a regular basis, um, they're craving authenticity from artists, from experiences, from businesses, from all of these things. Yeah. So I think it's being heralded in a way that maybe it hasn't been in the past decade or past couple of decades. Um, but ultimately, I think it comes down to memento mori for me. Like, I always keep in mind the fact that I'm going to die and not in a macabre way, but in a very stoic way. Mm -hmm. And the question becomes, how do I want to spend these very finite days and moments of my life, of you know, trying to appease to this sort of 
whatever this idea is that exists externally or serving myself internally, which ultimately allows me to better serve those that I encounter in my life. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's, a, that's absolutely a, a vital way to think about this kind of work is, is that you, yes, you are serving other people, but in order to do so, you've got to be the best version of yourself. You've got to be the truest version of yourself. Lots of people I speak to on this podcast, authenticity is an important word for them. Um, and I'm interested in this word in, in many different ways. And I think one of the reasons why I, why I wanted to kind of pick up on this word is the idea that for a lot of people, auth authentic expression, is, is authentic expression necessarily this idea of truth? Is it the kind of proximate, proximate mm. to truth? Or is it a kind of form of storytelling in a sense? Like, you know, or like what's its relationship to a mul multiple sort of valences of truth? And I think that, you know, because for example, I was doing a, an interview with um, uh, a photographer based in, in Hong Kong a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, his, uh, his work is primarily shot on film and either medium format or large format film photography. And he was talking about this idea of authenticity and, and analog to truth, mm. because it's like, you've got this kind of almost documentary style of work there to take, you know, you're, you're taking those photographs. There's yeah. one opportunity to get a good photograph with, with a large format camera or something. Whereas your work is really staged. Your work is really like um, stage managed, crafted. You've got multiple elements that are part of that process that are uh, about like, you know, revealing and concealing and playing with this kind of light and dark, this kind of, you know, doesn't make it any less true doesn't make it any less authentic because it's authentic to you, but it's absolutely more performed and staged and, you know, engages with this kind of concept of um, uh, art, artifice as well. So I think it's kind of an interesting, it's an interesting thing that you would bring this up as well as, as my sort of documentary photographer friend. So yeah, and I, I think you're right. I think like all things, there there's shades of gray in between there. Um, you know, I, I will say I, I infuse a high degree of theatricality into my work. I think that's something that drives it heavily. Um, and it's, it's very performative in that way. So what I like to do personally is, is create this stage. So, you know, obviously I'm boxed in by these things to limit the echo here. Uh, but I like to create these grandiose stages and sort of allow the individuals I photograph to embody different characters or iterations mm -hmm. of self. And so there is a performative nature, but I feel like performance offers us an opportunity to get in touch with ourselves in a deeper way that we may not allow ourselves to do off of the stage, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a great deal of respect for film photographers, for analog, for reportage, you know, for these things that are literal replications of that moment insofar as we can replicate or archive one of these passing moments. Um, for me, I think the authenticity is an expression of an internal state. So there's that variance in that, like what is authentic to an individual and just what does the word even mean? And we start to get into the weeds there a little bit. Um, but I don't necessarily think that it is in line with truth. Like one of my favorite photographers is Paolo Reversi. I mm, absolutely love yeah. his work and so much of it are these dreamscapes. He's painting with a mag light and it's large format and it's long exposures. So very little of that is what someone would see in the moment, but it is his truth. Of it course. is how he sees the scene, how he experiences the individual. So I think there's that subjectivity in it. And to me, that's one of the great beauties of, of art and of photography is we have this singular medium that allows us all to sort of reach into ourselves or reach into the world and catalog and archive and express in this multitude of ways. Um, and it's, it's very fascinating. Mm -hmm. For people who are listening rather than watching this, Johnny is sat in his studio with a number of backdrops behind you, which I think are hand painted backdrops. But then also, there are two big <laughs> V flats, black V flats that are kind of encroaching on the space. It looks purposeful, but you started with just the backdrops and not the V flats. The V flats are there to limit the echo from the correct massive yeah, studio so, that you're sat in. <laughs> so I have I have 15 foot ceilings in my studio, and it's all these really lovely concrete floors, and there's there's no sound deadening in here. I mean, this is as echo as, as echo e as it can get. Yeah. So um, Barry and I were on here trying to troubleshoot this, and I said, well, I could build myself a little room to try and limit the echo. And and at first, I had the white side of the V flat. I sat down. And I'm like, oh, that's just gauche. Like I can't deal with that. So I turned it to the black side and I'm like, this is going to be better for the light. It's going to go better with the scene. 
Um, but there, I, I think for me, you know, even when I do things like this, when I'm on camera or when I'm out in the world, I, I there's a level of eccentricity to my personality. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's almost this very fascinating social experiment to me to see how people respond relative to how we present. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you walk out and you're in a, uh, an old world blazer and you're in a bowler like I'm wearing right now. And people are like, oh, it's very gentlemanly. It's this, it's that. You know, I walk out and I'm wearing a black trench coat and something else. And people are like, oh, you're very intimidating or whatever else. Mm -hmm. So we, it's almost this game that we get to play with how we put ourselves into the world and, and how we are perceived relative to that presentation. And it's not in a way where I'm trying to manipulate anyone. It's just fascinating to me to see sort of the in out process of that, you know, input versus output, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and this, this is in, infused in your work. I was, I was looking at the work uh, in more depth before I started this, this conversation with you. And one of the things I noted was that you do a lot of, um, personal work self-portraiture mostly you know this is kind of self-portraiture work um and i think that there's there's something beautiful about this work that's really like an in-depth engagement with yourself as a person and as a photographer that kind of double moment where you're both the photographer and the subject what led you to do more like presumably this is like an exploration process for you but it's also a kind of technical exploration process it's a uh, it's an ex yeah tell me more about self portraiture no very much i i think there's there's sort of multiple elements of that like most things um when i was younger like i was i was a dancer i was an actor i did modeling i did those things so like i have a, a degree of familiarity with being on camera mm -hmm. and also a certain passion for it i'm um, mm -hmm. going back to that performative element of my respective personal archetype or however we want to phrase that um but photography i would say and it's not an exaggeration quite literally saved my life mm -hmm. and so i feel very indebted into it so it gave me a second chance in this world and then it became a conduit for me to go even deeper into myself and that's what self-portraiture has sort of been for me it's been this inward spiral especially into the dissonant parts of myself um, whenever I speak to other photographers about self-portraiture, there's generally this this anxiety to go getting in front of the camera, oh, me taking a photo of myself. And, and there's because it, it's inherently vulnerable and it exposes us to parts of ourselves that maybe we don't necessarily want to see. It could be physical, it could be mental, it could be perceptual, it can be all of these things. So for me, it started almost as an egoic challenge to say, hey, I want to get great photos of myself. There was an absolute vanity associated with it. Like my work's <laughs> starting to get caught. I'm, you know, in galleries, I'm doing these things. I want a photo that makes people stop and go, who the hell is this guy? Sure, so yeah. it started there. But as I delved into it more, I realized that it was revealing a lot of insecurities, a lot of discomfort and dissonance within myself about myself and my place in the world. And it became almost this very direct therapeutic practice with myself to the extent where it was almost meditative. Um, and then COVID certainly magnified that exponentially. Sure, so, yeah. um, you know, before, like so many of us, before COVID hit, I was in a very um, dense flow. I was creating all the time. I was working on big productions. I was working with editorial teams. And I was defining myself very much by my work. So I'm like, I am an artist. I am a creative. I am a photographer. I am an art director. It was all of these things. And then it just stopped. Mm -hmm. And there was just silence. And I went, oh, now that I'm not those things, who am I? And so it sort of spiraled me into this very Nietzschean existential state that wasn't exactly wonderful. Um, and I said, well, I'm, I'm still a creator, regardless of whether I'm creating or not. But I felt that compulsion to still be creating portraits. And I went, well, now I am the subject. Mm -hmm. And that was also a point where I was trying to define my style a little bit more and experiment with lighting and set design. And I said, all right, well... I can connect to myself, I can be the medium, I can be the subject, and I can also be the test subject. So there is this element, like you said, of, of going into myself, but there's also this bit where I'm like, all right, I wanna test light, and I don't feel like looking like you know a noob or an amateur when I bring a friend in, so I'm gonna use myself as the test subject and take off the pressure. Because I, I feel very compelled by wanting to deliver an exceptional experience to anyone who steps in front of my camera. I want them to walk away and feel better than when they walked in. That's sort of part and parcel for my process. But when I'm experimenting overtly, when that's my only end goal is to experiment, I don't feel like I can deliver that. So by, by photographing myself, I'm like, well, I, I owe nothing to myself. I'm not indebted. This is just my time, my life. And so it allowed me to play creatively in a way that I had not allowed myself to do before, which 
is where I think growth really takes place in these these areas of the unknown or these areas of discomfort. So then then it became this sort of full package totality where I'm like, all right, I'm I'm going into myself, I'm learning my craft. I'm experimenting, I'm exploring. And then it was never the intent, but when I started to share some of those portraits, they ended up being some of my most, I would say, revered or liked mm -hmm. or shared or well-known work mm -hmm. um, to the extent where I'll still see people and they're like, oh, I love, I love, I love that you're a self-portraitist. And I'm like, well, I am. That's not really all that I am, but it's <laughs> so it almost took on a life of its own that was completely yeah. unexpected. And I'm sure that's in part because of everything that I put into it and that sort of energetic element of the work that we create. Uh, mm -hmm. or lack thereof. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the work. Um, I'm going to try and describe your work a little bit. Please. Uh, people who are listening in or watching in, um, you will have to go and look at Johnny's work to get the full picture. Um, it feels to me like you're exploring parts of people's lives that they don't get the opportunity to explore in their day-to-day -day life. It feels like you are reading somebody who comes into your studio and you say, let's try this crazy idea out with, I don't know, a set of angel wings, or let's put this intense light situation here. But on the other hand, you have these very sensitive, delicate little moments in those shoots. I can remember looking back at your work. It must've been about a year, year and a half ago. And I was like, there's a whole series of photographs here of this one woman and there's like, you know, the big expansive set that you've set up in your studio. And then there's this really gentle, delicate looking out of a window photograph. So there's this kind of whole range of editorial style photographs where it's like, on the one hand, it's like an insane amount of work. But then on the other hand, it's like, I've taken a quick snap of a moment, a fleeting moment in her mind or their minds. Um, and it, it encompasses both, on the one hand, I mean, both you and I are big fans of hand-painted canvas backdrops. Very much You've so. You've got a lot of them. They're all scattered all over your massive studio. Um, you set them up in different kinds of ways to overlap and so forth. Um, and then you use light in very creative kind of ways. But you also use light in very kind of, like there's this interesting play, right? Creativity and pushing the boundaries, but also kind of, kind of some kind of conventional use of light, which shows a very kind of beautiful kind of, um, let's say, a stylized portrait look. Am I kind of approaching what, is that no, how you No, no, that, 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 that might be the best description I've heard in a long time. <laughs> so I appreciate that. I think, you know, especially where you led with this sort of um, exploration of iterations of self, mm. uh, that, that is a major driving factor for my work. Um, and I think societally, at least in, in this part of the world, um, we are overtly pressured to be a thing, whatever sure. that thing is most of the time. And there's a familial element, there's a societal element, there's a psychological element, there is, of course, the social media, the digital element and all of these different things. But very few people, I think, feel as though they can explore or express themselves in earnest in a space where they will still be seen and heard and accepted for that exploration. So I always want my studio or whatever space I'm creating in to be that space for the individual to say like, hey, I'm not going to impose anything upon you, but I'm going to suggest things based on what I'm getting from you energetically or personality wise or story wise. Mm -hmm. And a big part of that is, you know, if you came to me for a session and you were a client, I might book a half day for you. And I won't even have things set up, which I, it, it's going to make a lot of people out there aghast. Like, how dare you not have things set up for your client? <laughs> but because what I'm doing is for the first 30 minutes or so, as I'm setting things up, I'm, I'm talking. Mm -hmm. I'm going, oh, this, oh, that. And I want to learn about the person. So that way I can make informed suggestions based on the information that they're giving me. So I'd like to say that I have telepathy and someone can walk into the room and I'm just like, I know you want to be you know, King Louis the fourth or whatever it might be. It's, it's not that it's, it's a, it's a process of give and take. Mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with people. I'm passionate about people. I, I really do love humans and humanity despite all of our awfulness. Mm -hmm. And so I want to get to know people. And then in getting to know people, I feel like it affords me the opportunity to put things out there that, that may challenge them from a place of, of love. Um, and acceptance. And it's, it's hard to even quantify that. It's become much more important to me over the course of time and, and with age, I think as well, um, we prioritize things very differently. So mm -hmm. there's that element. I think even in those editorial series, um, if any of you know my work, you know that it's very rare to see a single photo from me. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that's just not how my mind operates. It's usually a series of six, eight, 10, 12, even more. Um, and, and for me, that allows me to explore the individual while the individual is exploring themselves. But even the grandiosity, I think there's a certain element for me of, of short circuiting the brain to hopefully create moments of, of disarmament. And so, you know, there's all these scenes and there's sets and there's three lights or there's seven lights and they're wearing, you know, a, a fur coat from the 1800s that a fur trader sold to the Lakota Sioux tribe here in Colorado. And it's just so almost over the top yeah. that people get lost in that element in the space and all of that. And then if we take that off and we put them in just a t-shirt or a turtleneck or something that's subdued, there's this breath. So the whole thing is like this big inhale. Mm -hmm. And then there's those moments that are the exhale. And that's one of my favorite things. I would say people probably don't know that for me, but that's always what I'm pining after. Those moments where we're just literally two human beings co-occupying a space, present and quiet together. So, so much of the noise that I create is in hopes of reaching a place of quiet. Um, that's mm. probably the best way of putting it. And then lights, I'm just, I'm a nerd, obviously, with what I went to school for. I'm obsessed with physics and this interplay of light and shadow and sort of the poetic element and dimensionality and everything else. So, so much of that is just, there is a conventional thing where I don't want, over the course of a series, I don't want my lighting or my set design or styling to overshadow the individual. So I think even in that, the fact that I share in series, it gives me a chance to do things that are much less typical or much more exploratory, but also return back to something that I think is, is much more easily digested or, or much more subtle where the individual then steps forward into the limelight instead of being part of the foreground or background. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always this give and take and, and trying to find those moments or carve things out. And it's it's chaos. I mean, that's sort of how my mind operates and the process itself is chaos. But in that chaos, I wind up usually discovering some calm. And that's always um, a really beautiful moment for me. Mm -hmm. That's, I, I think I find this really interesting. You, you think in series then. So before you even sit down to, to look at the photographs that you've taken, you're th you've thought in a way, piecing them together in a series of six, eight, 12 or whatever, um, makes me wonder, who are your clients? Uh, it's, it, it varies a great deal. Um, mm -hmm. So I do work in the commercial sector. I work with designers. I work with boutiques. I do lookbooks. I do that type of thing. Um, mostly these days, it's kind of curious. It's, it's other photographers. So okay. photographers come to me from around the nation at this point around the world, which is just insane to me still. I haven't quite accepted the fact that someone would come from, you know, the UK or South America. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, but that's something that I still need to internalize properly. But it's photographers who I think want to explore themselves. And, and so there's, there's an individualistic element. But that's where most of my day-to-day -day clients are now. They're fellow photographers or artists of different mediums who want something that's atypical, but that's still also true to them. Um, and I think that's something that I try and do with my work is I, even though I have my own style, I have my own voice, I don't want that to be an overlay on the individual. So everything sort of starts from a baseline. I have my studio and my ways of doing things, but I think people have sort of seen or heard or felt or, or you know, gotten from a person who's been here with me, this aspect of, of exploration and of individuality, and that's what they're seeking. At least that's what I hope that they're seeking. Um, so that that's a really big part of what I do these days is folks coming in and they're like, hey, and sometimes it's, I don't want to say vain, but it is more superficial. Someone's like, Johnny, I want to feel like I'm on the cover of Vogue in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, absolutely we can do that and then that sort of cover photo element of the shoot then evolves or devolves into something that goes deeper mm -hmm. um and that that's it so yeah it's 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 sort of curious to even reflect on that and that's changed a lot over time i used to do a lot more directly with models and i still work with models so i work with modeling agencies and i do that type of thing but in terms of the people who are coming to me in earnest um it's usually artists who are looking i think to explore themselves and maybe reach a point of, of contentment or acceptance with themselves in a way in hopes mm -hmm. that the session will afford them that and also give them these images that sort of archive this respective phase of their journey as an individual mm -hmm. and as a creative. Okay. Um, so yeah, I was, um, interestingly, I was uh, contacted by a client um, uh, a couple of days ago about doing a shoot in, 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 in a few months time. Um, and she had been 
uh, instructed by her therapist to, to come and to experience being in front of the camera. So yeah, this shoot isn't really for photographs. She's, she doesn't need photographs for, you know, because I predominantly do headshots. She doesn't need headshots for her LinkedIn profile or so forth, but she needs photographs because she wants to experience being in front of the camera. So I love this thing about, you know, I, I said to her, I was like, you know, if you've got, if you, if you are concerned about your self image and you're worried about that, it might not be the experience that you want it to be. It's true. You know, it might not be an experience that you actually enjoy in quite the same way that you think you're going to. So, you know, you have, you have a style that people come to you specifically for that style. They know what they're getting when they come to you. And we all, we all want that. We all want to be in that situation where it's like, Someone's coming to us specifically for what we shoot. Now, there is no way that someone's coming to you and being like, so I want something that looks like this. And it's all in like stark, like bold, like yellows and blues. And it's bright and like, you know. Generally kind of, not. <laughs> they, they come specifically for the kind of thing that you do. Or does it ever happen that someone comes along and goes, oh, no, I don't want to do what you do. <laughs> it's, uh, to, to be honest, probably more than I think most would think. Um, there's an element, at least I think there, there's murmurs about me in the industry, let's say in the modeling world or different worlds, the, the experience element. So sort of the experience that I create for the individual. So I will get notes from people who go, hey, Johnny, I've heard amazing things from so-and-so about their experience with you. Like, I would love a session. This is what I want. I know you don't do this, but would you do this for me? And, and there's this ask on it. And it, sometimes I'll say yes, and sometimes I'll say no. Mm -hmm. um, if I feel like I'm going to have to trade in on something that's sort of integral to my, my process or my aesthetic, I won't do it. I'll recommend them to someone who where that's their wheelhouse. Uh, but there's other times when I'm like, if they come to me in earnest and, you know, I, I think I have sort of, and, and maybe, maybe I'm wrong with this. Maybe it's, it's perfectly typical, but it, to me, in my mind, it's a bit atypical where I have clients who will come to me at major life transitions. Mm -hmm. So like, I just had an individual reach out to me and she was like, listen, I'm going through a brutal divorce. There's been a lot of abuse of different sorts. I lost myself in the process of this. I'm looking to reconnect with myself. I'm hoping that this session for you can be that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's beautiful. It's powerful. It's also horrifying mm -hmm. because the, the weight and the gravity of that for me, and to me, it's such an honorific. It means so much to me, truly. Like I think that speaks to everything that I've worked for over the past decade. But I'm like, wow, there's this very vulnerable raw human being walking into my space looking for something overtly life-changing so you know it's almost like russian roulette i feel like you know the the there's a bullet in the chamber and it's cocked when they walk in and there's part of me that loves that that revels in that the challenge of that but there's also this part of me that goes wow if i fuck this up like i am i am ruining a human being and that's probably me being <laughs> egoic i doubt that a bad session is going to lead someone down the primrose path to something atrocious but um, I, I like to sort of um, honor the individuals who come in. So I don't know. It's, it's curious. And I'll be, I'll be interested how that session turns out for you yeah, with this individual I, who contacted I, I you. And in fact, I just had a session with a friend of mine. She probably wouldn't mind if I called her out name-wise, but I won't out of respect for her. <laughs> um, but she came in for something very similar. Mm -hmm. So a uh, fellow photographer um, who's based here as well and was like, listen, I need to be photographed, but I don't want any photographs. I just want to do this for the experience to be in front of your camera. And I went, okay. And we created, to me, a beautiful collection. I love it. With her permission, I'll share it, even if she doesn't want to share it or doesn't want photos. Um, but it was this really interesting experience because I didn't, it sort of took the need to produce off of me, right? If someone buys a package and they're getting 10 images, or of course we operate businesses, so I'm thinking about the possibility of upselling or ancillary elements, I knew that wasn't part of the equation. Like there was a flat rate associated with it. And I'm like, if she follows through on this, there is nothing else to be done. So one part of me, I guess, was a, a bit vexed by that. But in another way, it was liberating because I said, all right, I just get to create. There is no docket. There's no brief. There's no intent. There's no endpoint. Um, and it was a really interesting sort of free form intimate session that was really lovely for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's surreal at the same time when you get something that's so outside of the norm um, it challenges you to think differently and do differently and and be different in terms of what you're doing, why and how. Um, and I think that's a good thing, honestly, for us. Sounds good. You talked a little bit about your um, 
a little bit about the way that you construct your business there, which is that you have obviously a session fee and then people might buy images or do is it is it prints that they buy or do they buy images that are, are digital that so are it's it's both um i would say at this point it's probably about a split um so i used to be very keen on sort of that like in-person sales and print oriented and everything else and it got to the point where a lot of the people who were coming to me at that point in time simply and, and I know there's going to be someone out there who's going to con be contentious about this, but they just didn't want or need prints. And we can go, oh, you have to educate people on the importance of prints. And I agree. I Tangible, tactile art, archival quality things like this drives me. I'm surrounded by prints in my studio right now. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm not, once again, I'm not going to impose a thing upon someone. If they're like, hey, I simply want this portrait of me to exist digitally, and I just at least give them an opportunity to see prints. I'm not going to force them into that mm -hmm. hole, so to speak. Um, but it's a mix of those things. So generally, uh, I have a session fee, and that includes nothing. So that's literally time with me. That's not hair and makeup. That's not anything additional. I'm like, this is for the half day we're going to spend together and the experience that you're going to have. And I'm like, listen, I don't know that you're going to love the images. I hope that you do. But I do know that you're going to have a spectacular, singular, one-of-a-kind experience. I can guarantee that. I'll put my money where my mouth is on that. Um, and then I never want someone to have an image that they don't love. And honestly, I would probably be a bit richer if, if that wasn't my mindset. <laughs> but I want someone, if someone gets 20 images, I want it to be because they love those 20 images, not because I, you know, managed to use some neuro-linguistic programming on them during you know, the, the consult and kept flashing 20 during our Zoom meeting. And so they bought the 20 package. Um, sure. So I think that's, that's one of the things, but it's relatively free form. And I do have packages. So if someone knows, you know, if it's a branding thing or something commercial or a lookbook at that point, then it's very cut and dry commercial usage type of thing. But for individual clients, there tends to be that base. And then there is, hey, we can sort of commoditize this and lower the overall investment if you know what you want up front. However, um, let's just do this. And it keeps me on my toes. Mm -hmm. I think that's one thing that sort of is a driving factor for me is I, I respond very well to pressure. And when there's no pressure, I tend to become very indifferent and almost apathetic. So I like that element of being hungry where I'm like, they paid their session fee. It's nominal. Like I charge what I'm worth, but it's nominal relative to everything else. Now I have to deliver something. Like if I want to eat I have to deliver. And it's. And I know there's people out there going, oh, that's a terrible way to exist. But for me, it, it keeps me invested. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the biggest things for me is how do I stay invested in my art? How do I stay invested in my process? How do I stay present? How am I there 100% so that I can give 100% to these people who I am fortunate enough to have in front of my lens? Yeah. And part of that is keeping things a bit more open-ended. And that's certainly not for everyone. And there's probably some weird miswiring in my brain because of trauma from childhood <laughs> at work there uh but it's just it's it's a function that i found works best for me nice i i also love having a longer session spending some time talking to someone beforehand not really planning anything not having anything set up or even leaving it set up from the night before being like you know whatever it is um and and really going oh what is it, what is it that you want to do and and trying to to kind of match my vision with with theirs um so i totally understand that we work on very different scales though yeah <laughs> um most notably in the sense that your studio is enormous now size isn't everything but <laughs> it does help you've got i mean i've seen um short like reels videos behind behind the scenes things of your of your studio um i love a good studio tour I, I search out studio tours online and I'm surprised you haven't done a, a really in-depth studio tour yet. So it's, it's, it's on the docket. What's really funny is if you go to look for like anything about me online, in terms of video, there's very little. Like there aren't tutorials by me. There's a couple of things that I've done like with Nanlight. Um, there are a couple of things that I did back in the day with like Pro EDU that are more exposés, but there's really nothing mm. out there for me. And I need to do a proper studio tour. Um, that's, that's definitely high on my docket. And in fact, I'm, I'm doing this whole education platform thing over the next month or two which will sort of consolidate all of this and i'll actually put pen to paper so to speak and people can find out my editing process and some of the rationale and you create a process in general but yeah the studio is huge um to the extent where it's probably overwhelming and for most people i think it looks more like 
an art gallery or a museum than it does a studio. Mm -hmm. You know, people in general, at least especially the, the lay person, as much as I load that term, individuals who aren't actively involved in the photographic industry, they picture studio and they think sterile. They think sure. a psych wall, you know, they think this very clinical almost type of environment. And I wanted to have something that was very antithetical to that. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you walk into the front door and there's antiques everywhere and there's old pianos and there's candelabras and there's art on the wall and it's literally floor to ceiling canvas in here. Mm -hmm. Like I just built this set that's behind me now and there was a patch of white wall that was there and I started getting a twitch. <laughs> so I had to, I had to, I had to piece in something. <laughs> Um, to sort of fill it. But I think even then, like there's a, a grandiosity to the studio that plays into my process, that plays into my personality. And while it's it's very full, it's also relatively minimalist. So there's things on the walls everywhere, but like if I could turn this camera around right now, there is this vast empty space in the center mm -hmm. of the studio. So I sort of toe this line between maximalism and minimalism, but the space affords me the opportunity to work in a way that my last space didn't. Mm -hmm. um, so my last space was, I want to say about 550 square feet and I had eight and a half foot ceilings and I created beautiful work there, but it was ridiculous. Like I had all the lion's share of what's currently in the studio. So if I wanted to switch sets, I had to like deconstruct. It was like Tetris. I would take, you know, the seven old steamer trunks yeah. that I had and move them to the side and the wardrobe rack would move. And it was like a CrossFit workout every yeah. time I had to switch sets. <laughs> um, so in here, there's all of these different vignettes and they're set up based on texture and they're set up based on period and they're set up based on, you know, tonal cohesion or tonal dissonance and all of these. So it allows me to pivot when I'm working with a person. And since I am so sort of spontaneous and chaotic, I can say, you know, I know you didn't bring it in, but like, how would you feel about that turtleneck? And we've been shooting with all of this constant lighter strobes. Let's go to the front. Let's go to the front on the olive set. And it's just natural light. It's coming in really beautifully right now. So there's all of these scenes set up and I'm so ADHD that if it's not in front of me, it doesn't exist. <laughs> so if I have things that are packed away, seriously, I just did an inventory in my studio and it was like, a trove. It was like a kid at Christmas. I'm like, I have all of these cool things. Why do I have three gimbals? Like, why would any human being when I don't even do video work? So yeah. I started posting on, on Facebook Marketplace right away. Um, but if, if it's not in front of me, it doesn't exist. So I, I like to have these options so that I can turn and I'm like, actually, maybe we should be on the taupe instead of the brown because your skin tone plays so beautifully with that. Mm -hmm. um, and I like that element of service for my clients as well because they walk in and they're like, well, what are we going to do? I'm like, we're going to do all things. We're going we're gonna to find out what works best for you. All of these things are here. This whole studio is here to avail itself to you in your session, your individuality. Um, and it's wild. So I still, I still have that moment. Like this was the studio I dreamed of half a de decade ago. Mm -hmm. You know, when I got my first canvas backdrop, it was like one from Savage that I had bought from a wedding photographer on Facebook marketplace and it had footprints on it, you know, and all these other things, but I had it up and I was like, Ooh, texture. And I would see the Olafonts <laughs> and I would see all of these things. And I'm like, that's never in the cards for me. And now sometimes I'll sit here, you know, with a glass of wine or, you know, a, a snifter of some, something rather, mm -hmm. Um, and I'm just like, holy shit, like this is, this is actually mine. Like I've, I've built this and not just for myself, but for my clients and also for my, my students, you know, because education is a big part of my world now. So having a space like this to be able to teach in where there's, you know, three models or subjects that are up and it's very immersive and, and there's space to breathe and play and create and explore. Um, it's, it's pretty fantastic. And I'm, I'm immensely grateful. I lucked into this space. It was synchronicity. I won't get too too deep into the weeds with this, but a couple of years ago at my old studio, I was I was stabbed, um, and it was a very life changing experience. Total random act of violence, and they ended up severing my femoral artery in in my left leg, and so I almost bled to death on the street in front of my studio, which was so surreal. And I remember thinking when I was and, and luckily, I, I always have to say this: there was someone who stopped who managed to get my belt off. I told them I needed a tourniquet. They put it on and they saved my life. And I tried to find this person for six months. I put social media posts out and posters out. And literally, if there's such thing as, you know, angels of any sort, that's what this person was. Mm -hmm. And they sounded like mach ma Macho Man Randy Savage. They got out of their car and they're like, hey, brother, you don't look so good. What do you need? And I'm like, uh, I'm bleeding to death. Could you put a tourniquet on? He was like, yeah. And he wow. puts it on like, like this. And I was like, are you an EMT? Are you a doctor? He's like, army medic, serve five tours. 
So the exact person you want in that scenario, right. and I was in the back of the ambulance, he came over, he smacked me on the ass, gave me a kiss on the forehead and said, you're going to be okay, sweetie, and walked away. It was the most <laughs> surreal thing ever. Absolutely. But I remember, it was seriously, and I remember being in the back of this ambulance, I was like such a deviant in my 20s and in my late teens, like a maniac. And I'm like, I did all of these things where someone should have stabbed me by all right. And now I'm leaving my studio after a day of community oriented artwork and I get stabbed. Um, <laughs> point being is I was going through all of this recovery. And when I got out of the hospital, I went, well, I can't be in that space anymore. When I first went back to my studio, there was still literally a pool of blood in the street that hadn't completely abated. And so the association was just too much for me. Um, and I, I, I can say with, with absolute certainty and complete comfortability that, that I am not strong enough to deal with that on a daily basis. So I started looking for another thing. And I had a friend here, Mike, who had a cohabitated artist space. So there was a fashion designer. He's a painter and a sculptor. There was another painter. And managing artists is, we'll say, a task to keep things PC. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So he was looking to get out of his lease. And he's, he was calling me for advice. And I said, I knew the space. And I'm like, I love the space. Like, let's, let's meet and chat. So I crutched my way over and I walked in and it needed so much work. There were old drop ceilings and defunct HVAC ducting and the back was a mess and floors needed to be this. But I looked at it and I saw potential and I had this talk with myself and I went, if not now, when? Like, I just almost died. Like, if that's not enough of a catalyst for me to jump, for me to take this leap into something I've always wanted and I know I need, then it's never going to happen. So the sort of the, the, the question I asked myself was, do you want, are you going to take this leap or are you going to get out of this entirely? It was one or the other. Because I felt like I, if, if I didn't do it, I was telling myself that it was never going to be important enough, in which case I needed to pivot in my life. And if I did do it, I just needed to say to hell with it. Whatever comes will come, but I'm going to try. And so I decided to try. And I was in here, you know, painting walls and scraping things. And my leg was the size of a, you know, watermelon. And my physical therapist was like, you're an idiot. And I'm having these, like, if anyone's seen the notebook, like these Ryan Gosling moments where I'm crying, like, what am I doing with my life? This was the biggest mistake I've ever made. And then day by day, it started coming together. And then pieces of the studio started showing up here. And, and it was this very cliche to say, but this giant leap of faith for me. Um, mm -hmm. To say, you know, I only have this one leg for the moment to leap off of, but it was so significant or it felt so significant. It was now or never. And I'm so thankful um, and grateful that I decided to take that leap. And for the people in my life who said, go, jump, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and if you fall, you'll fall into water, you'll fall into a net, you'll find you have wings, but like you have to do this. And mm -hmm. I think we're challenged on our journey, especially as creatives to take these leaps. And it's usually at the point of the greatest discomfort when I feel like we're on the precipice of something so significant for ourselves. And it's, it's challenging is, is anything, um, but the, the reward is spectacular. Mm. I mean, that's one hell of a challenge. Uh, so it's, it, it's, not, it's not quite the same as everyone else's challenges. No, it was, it was weird. And it's, it's funny. I talk about it now and it's in passing. You know, someone will be like, oh, Johnny got stabbed. And it's like, it's so matter of fact to me. Like I've had, I've had a very colorful life starting at childhood and I've gone through a lot of things. So, you know, it was one of those bits where I came out and at first I almost died. And then, and let me know if you hear my heater at all. It just kicked in my furnace. Not to everyone. This is the chaos that exists right now. This giant <laughs> furnace is probably going to fall on me as I'm talking. Um, no, I'm knock on canvas. That's not going to happen. Um, but yeah, so it's just, it's, I think it's circumstance and it's perspective for me as I started to emerge from that, I went, all right, I could have died. I didn't. Um, and then I could have lost my leg. They almost couldn't save the leg because of nerve damage. So I would have lost my leg from the knee down, and I didn't. Um, they thought there was going to be so much nerve damage that I wasn't going to be able to lift my foot. I was going to have a condition called drop foot for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen. Um, and so as horrible as that was, I'm not necessarily, I'm not grateful that it happened. It's, it's awful, but it could have been so much worse. And it pushed me in this other direction, or maybe I allowed myself to be shifted in this direction. So I just like to maintain perspective. And the other thing about it, too, is we all respond to variables in our lives differently. So you have someone who goes through something that overtly we would all say isn't a big deal, and it breaks them as a human being. And then you have other people who walk through fire and get out on the other side and go, I'm thirsty, and laugh about it. <laughs> and so there's this beautiful sort of subjectivity to experience. So I never want to magnify or minimize my experience. And I actually 
pale sometimes to talk about that or some of the other things I've been through because I never want someone to minimize their own experience based on how they're maximizing mine. Um, and so there's a certain guardedness about some of that trauma for me where I never want it to be a counterpoint where someone goes, well, Johnny's doing great and he has a 2,500 square foot studio and he almost got murdered. So what am I doing with my life? Like, I, don't, I never want my story to be that. And I can't control that, of course, but I'm very hyper aware of it. Of course. How long ago was that? Uh, two years ago, as of March 22nd. Oh, wow. Okay. To the day. So, okay. So that's pretty recent. Yeah, relatively. Yeah. And like, this it's almost like you've I mean, obviously you had the studio before you were doing all this work, but it's like you came into this space and suddenly the everything kind of clicked and, and came together and, and the work just almost like grew to fill the space in a way. Very, very, very much so. And I think, yeah. I think for me that element, once again, it was the catalyst, even as far as like what I consider to be authenticity in my own work, creating work that speaks to me first and foremost, or that speaks to the individuals that I photograph, not keeping the algorithm in mind not keeping marketability or PR in mind, just going like, I'm gonna create what I wanna create because time is limited. Going back to that memento mori, I've always been a, a, a death obsessed person, even as a kid, like morbidly so. You know, like other five-year-olds were asking about Santa Claus and I was like, what happens when my body decomposes, dada? Like it was very, <laughs> probably off-putting to my parents, bless their hearts. Yeah. Um, but I think for me, it brought it to the forefront. So it was this thing that I know that then I experienced and I'm just like, you know, and pardon, pardon my, my French, so to speak, everyone, but I went, fuck it. You know, mm -hmm. I went just like, what? No, no. Like I'm beholden to myself and that's it. And, and to the people in my life who are important and to society for whatever impact I want to have directly or indirectly. And so I, I felt like the whole experience in totality was an untethering of sorts mm -hmm. where any of the constraints that I was placing on myself, it was no one else. It had nothing to do with the world. It was something that I had wrapped myself into. I sort of unshackled myself and went, let's, let's just go. Let's do this. And let's, let's actually, you know, get in the driver's seat, so to speak, because I'm only accountable to myself. And ultimately, in the end, if I have a moment to reflect before I pass on to whatever is next, it's my responsibility to have said, I led a good life. Mm -hmm. I did what I wanted to do. I created what I wanted to create. I connected. I traveled. I did all of these things that I wanted to do. That is wholly on me. So just mm -hmm. wanting to own that, that beautiful responsibility and do the most that I possibly could with it and can with it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the motivation from the very beginning, really, the beginning of our conversation where you described how you left a job, which by all societal measures was a good job, but was killing you in a sense. Yeah, you know? absolutely. It's the, sa it's the same thing. It's, you know, the job was the stab in the same way that the stab was the job right it's that it's kind of very much so it's this thing that's just um you know i i i've never been a person to have a job <laughs> so <laughs> i uh i had a job i had a job for um a it shall remain nameless a large um uh financial institution uh a number of years ago when i first left university and i remember uh going up to my line manager one day and just being like you have to sack me and she's like, what the fuck are you talking about? I was like, you have to sack me because I want to sign on and become an artist. Yeah, I love that. And she was like, I'm not going to sack you. I can't just sack you. And uh, hilariously, we were sat in the meeting room and she sat down and sat on a big bag of weed. <laughs> this big bag of skunk. This is in Brighton. So there's like people are dropping weed left, right and center. Yeah. Um, and um and I just was like, damn, I should have pretended that was mine. <laughs> but uh, no, I left, goods. That, yeah, I, left, I left for lunch and turned my phone off for four days uh, at that point. But that was the only job that I had that I could consider to be a job that was like a job job. You know, I've, I've, I've taught at university for over 15 years. I've you know, obviously run this business for a, a few years. Um, and I've had other kinds of things like I'm a DJ. I've you know always worked in bars and all that kind of stuff, but at the same time, none of that has felt like I'm trying to make shareholders richer. Yeah, you know, of course, I'm sure some shareholders have got richer off my off my work along the way, but never has it felt like I've been in that kind of corporate grind. And yeah. I just don't think I've ever had it in me to do that. It's never been something that I've I've been able to. I've been incredibly lucky in the sense that I fell on my feet, even at the poorest times of my life, where I've been earning no money. I've been I've fallen on my feet. Um, many, may, mostly because of um, 
you know, friends and family and stuff around being incredibly supportive, being like, yes, of course you can come and stay with me, sleep on, sleep on my sofa for whatever. Um, but I, you know, for me, it's like my moment of, of leaving the, uh, the job and, and starting a gallery space. It was, I think it's a defining moment for me in my life as well, because it's so important, these spaces. And I think the studio is actually a vital story in this. I think that's why I think for you, it's a really vital part of this story. It's creating these like literally physical spaces in which people can congregate and do things. I ran a gallery for a number of years and it was like you bring people into that space. It's very different from just being an artist. Oh, just absolutely. being a photographer, having some sort of place to invite people to, whether that's for a party, whether that's for a, a community forward thinking kind of space or conversation, whether that's for an exhibition, whether that's for a studio. The space is so important. And for me, that's like the driving force behind all of this is like being able to get into a situation where I can like have that space, whether that's a studio space or whether that's my home or whatever it is for, for me those things are super super important so i love the story because i think it's it, it exemplifies in a way on the one hand like what the fuck are you doing with your life if you are just making a, a shareholder rich yeah which i love i love that kind of oh kind of grit about about that story the longer story but it's also like it's like you are really creating something properly welcoming for people you know that people can experience a little element of the thing that you are, that you care about so memento mori and i think that that's such a important phrase for you because there's something there's something like deathly about your work as well there's something macabre there's something gothic about the work on the one hand it's incredibly beautiful and exploring this kind of like you know angelic kind of stuff but then there's also a very there's this darkness to it, which i think is is this kind of other side of you, which is very much like remembering I'm going to die, um, which is well, wonderful. Yeah, I, th I think, I, and I appreciate you saying that. I think for me, you know, sort of the the full circle has been the duality of all things. So wanting not to shun one thing for the other, and they're not being good or bad, they're just being things. Mm -hmm. And wanting to embrace it as a whole. And I agree regarding the physical space. I think it's so important. And one of my favorite things is when someone comes into the studio, it could, it could be a client, it could be a colleague, it could be, I mean, I'll have the UPS driver come in sometimes to deliver these, you know, ungodly numbers of canvas backdrops that I'm ordering. Um, but people go, wow, like, I love it in here. I want to live in here. I want to stay here. And so I think a big driving force for me with the space too was it's, I, I grew up with a lot of absence. So I didn't really have like family. I didn't have support. I didn't have stability. I didn't have a space. So for me, this is me creating something for the world and for others that I didn't have. Now, the relevance of that might not be the same because if you had that, it's not going to mean the same thing, of course. But I wanted to have a place where people could come in and they would just feel easeful and they would feel peaceful and they would feel welcomed and they would feel almost at home. They would feel like they don't want to leave and they're just like, wow, I just feel so good here. And it's this thing that can't even be articulated. It's that sort of fourth dimensional, metaphysical, energetic aspect of like, I feel good in this space. And that's my greatest compliment. If someone comes in and they're like, oh, wow, Johnny, you have a great collection of backdrops. I'm like, that's nice to hear. Or like, <laughs> why do you have so many lights, you, you freak? You know, like that's, that's all things. But like when someone speaks to the actual experience, the feeling of being in here, and it's so positive and it's so such a counterpoint to what they generally experience in their everyday life, nothing brings me more joy. And if there's moments when I doubt myself, or I doubt this investment, or I doubt this space, I go back to those, those conversations. I go back to those expressions from these individuals who I've crossed paths with or who have come through the studio. And I'm like, no, this is, this is right. And it might not be right or proper a month from now or a year from now, but insofar as I made the decision and I'm here right now, this is exactly where I need to be. And this is exactly what I need to be doing. Yeah, that's fantastic. Johnny, we're going to wrap up very shortly, but I'm going to ask you some very prosaic and maybe even geeky questions. Okay, let's go for it. Uh, what camera do you shoot on? Uh, so I'm a Sony shooter. 
So I shoot with the Sony a7R4, and then I also shoot with the just the a7 IV. So I've been thinking of upgrading um, to the R5. I haven't done that yet. I also am incredibly fascinated with the GFX system, and That's I've been right. talking with Fuji about sending me a loaner for literally over a year, and they never have any in stock. <laughs> they go out to their Fuji ambassadors. So Fuji, if you're listening to this, I'm potentially ready to jump ecosystems. Um, so <laughs> throw me a camera to use for two weeks so I can see if I love it or not. Uh, you will love it. <laughs> That's what I've heard. Yeah, um, yeah, and I still, fine. so you were talking about the the gentleman who's an analog photographer. I still sh do shoot film as well. So um, medium format wise, I shoot with the Mamiya RB67. Mm -hmm. And on the 35 millimeter side, I have just a host of old, you know, mechanical cameras, the K1000 and Minolta SRT 101, all the classic student cameras. I love just the simplicity and the nostalgia of those. Fantastic. Fantastic. I have the uh, Mamiya rz as you, oh, you have the upgraded yeah, body have the upgrade i'm gonna upgrade uh yeah it's very nice well the thing um, that i love about those cameras too someone was in here looking at it i have it on the tripod across from me at the very front of the studio but i'm like it's also a brilliant self-defense weapon i'm like if worse comes to worse <laughs> yeah, that thing can be used on a tripod like a mace and it would still good. function perfectly fine <laughs> it'd be fine exactly <laughs> it'd probably take a photograph of the process of while it was mind. actually this, this beautiful <laughs> motion blur of, of the just primitive <laughs> the violence photograph you've ever taken yeah that would be it i would I, that I, I i never do single photos but that would be my decisive the photo one. and then i would retreat into hibernation for the rest of my life <laughs> right. the the final photo that's Amazing. it um Johnny, you, you did mention very briefly that you do um, you do education, and I know that you're doing some some workshops over the course of this next month. Do you want to just give a little plug out plug for that? Yeah, sure. Thank you. I appreciate uh, that opportunity. So I have um, a two day workshop, which is sort of my uh, de facto education offering, and it's called Artistic Alchemy, and it's essentially two immersive, chaotic, insane, incredible days of creation, all things creative process. So I break down everything that I do, not only what I do, but why I do it. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the whole thing is this very almost interactive theatrical performance where I, I narrate every single element, every single thought that comes to mind is expressed. And I expand on lighting and styling and set design and connection and retouching the little bit that I do and color grading and, and creative development and artistic development and, you know, owning one's voice and developing one's voice and all of these things. Mm -hmm. So it's these two anywhere from 10 to 12 hour days that are just so incredible and exhausting and bewildering. <laughs> I might not be the best sales pitch for this. If you want to be exhausted, come to my workshop. Um, <laughs> It, it, in my opinion, it's it's something unlike anything else that exists in the industry for a number of reasons. Um, and I, I hesitate to use these these sort of cliche buzzwords, but I do believe that it's it's transformative for the people that attend. And certainly, I I will say each workshop is transformative for me. Mm -hmm. I walk away feeling inspired. I look at myself differently. I look at the world differently. I look at the medium of photography differently. Um, and it's very powerful in that regard. So uh, I have one coming up at the end of this month here at my studio in Denver on the 27th and 28th um, that's sold out. I have one in Seattle on May 4th and 5th that I believe is also sold out. Um, and then I'm also running my first workshop in New York in the city in Harlem on May 18th and 19th. And for me, that's sort of a watershed workshop because ever since I stepped into the education space, roughly three and a half years ago, I've sort of dreamed secretly. My vision board has been to produce something in New York in the city. And it just seemed like this pinnacle of what I could do domestically, you know, nationally here in the States. And the cards sort of aligned. And now I have the support of all of these international brands. And so I'm working with Nanlight. I'm also going to be working with Oliphant, who's going to be supplying backdrops. And that'll be a big thing. I'm going to get to photograph um, the Oliphant team while I'm in New York at their studio in Brooklyn, which I'm very excited about. Um, but yeah, so it's the, the education thing for me has been so interesting. And I never thought that I would find something that I was as passionate about as being behind the camera, as creating mm -hmm. portraits. And this may not be there, but it is a very proximate second. It's it's right there. So being able to be part of another creative's journey, being able to, you know, impart whatever I may know, but more more importantly, hopefully being able to instill a certain degree of certainty and confidence into these fellow artists where they walk out and they go, wow, I am a real artist and I do have something significant to say and I do wield power when I bring this camera up mm -hmm. and I am a force to be reckoned with. 
and I do have the capacity to do this. And it's not crazy for me to dream big or do big. Not only is it not crazy, it's necessary mm -hmm. in this world that is often so dimly lit to be a beacon and to shine my brightest for others who are still in the dark. And so for folks to walk away with that, with their head held high, owning their power, um, that has been fulfilling beyond words. Mm -hmm. And has brought me so much joy and so much sense of place and purpose. And I'm, I'm still amazed every time I run these workshops. It's and I, I seem very composed most of the time and most of the time I'm anything but. <laughs> um, but before these workshops, I'll be pacing around in the studio rehearsing. And it's funny because I never go I never run with a script. So I'll rehearse it for days. And then as soon as they walk in, I just, it all falls by the wayside and it's all off the cuff, yeah, but I'll rehearse and I'm like, is this going to be good? And then there'll be, you know, the eight or 10 people there and I'm looking at them all and I'm like, wow, like you all are here in my space <laughs> and you're paying me money to learn from me. And I go back to that deviant 20 year old. I go back to the person who had no bearing in life. I go back to that corporate shill who is wearing a mask going through the motions as a cog in the machine. I go back to all these iterations of self that were so little of me in so much of what I thought I needed to be or should be. And here I am now whole and wholehearted and people are seeking me out and it's so wonderfully surreal. Um, and that's probably a longer answer than it needed to be, but it just, it all for me stems from gratitude. I'm just so grateful for, for, and even this, the opportunity for us to chat and to mm. connect and talk about art and life. Like I'm, I'm just overflowing with, with a sense of um, gratitude and joy because of all of this, yeah, the whole fantastic. lot. That's fantastic. Johnny, before we finish, where Please. can people find you on the internet? Um, so you can find me on the interwebs. Uh, my website is www.johnnyedward.com. Uh, I basically have two first names. So it's Johnny without an H, J-O-N-N-Y. And my last name is Edward, E-D-W-A-R-D. So it's, I have to say this really quick. When I was in college, one of my best friends, his name was John Adams. And I was John Edward. And so we would go out to bars and we both looked really young. We looked like kids. And so the, the bouncers or security would look at me and go, John Edward, John Adams, get the fuck out of here. Like, so we would get rejected on that. Um, but you can find me there. That's where my portfolio is that I need to update. There's information on my workshops and all of that there. I'm most active on Instagram. Uh, so you can find me there and it's at Johnny, J-O-N-N-Y creative. Um, a lot of people come up to me and they know me, like you had said at the beginning of this, like they know me by Johnny Creative. So when I'm at conferences or I'm in a city, people go, hey, Johnny Creative, man, you're fucking cool. I'm like, thanks, bro. Um, but it's funny, the reason, like I actually started my Instagram, this was over a decade ago, specifically to archive my tattoos. So oh, wow. when I started getting heavily tattooed, it was there and I had like eschewed social media. I'm like, I hate it. I'm not going to be part of it. And then so many people were asking about the tattoos. I'm like, all right, I'll use it to archive. And then I started sharing poetry. This is very much pre-photography. Mm -hmm. um, but someone had my name, Johnny Edward, with the exact oh, spelling, the two first names. <laughs> and it was someone from the UK, ironically, <laughs> but with like, I think two followers in a completely inactive account. Mm -hmm. And so for, for about half a decade, every year, I would send this person a message and I would say, hey, you're not yeah. using your account. Like I will send you 500 US dollars if you'll free this account up so I can have my name. But now it's so funny. At some points, I'm like, I need to legally change my name to Johnny Creative because <laughs> that's how the world in mass and the yeah, universe sure. knows me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, find me on there. And, and if any of you have any questions, I'm, I'm an open book. I think one thing that I'm probably known for in this industry is I, I respond to everyone insofar as I can. I answer questions and I don't do that out, out of obligation. I do that from, from the bottom of my heart. And I love connecting. So, you know, send me a me email, shoot me a text. You can find my phone number everywhere. Please don't sex me um, <laughs> unless we know each other. Um, you can find me on social media and just say hi. But yeah, people are, are my great passion. So let's let's find a way to connect and, and, and see what's what. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Johnny. It was great to have you on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity.